Hello again for another look at Newark's history through time. Last time we looked at the Anglo-Saxon and Vikings and their effect on the area around Newark. And we saw the first instance of the name of Newark being used. The last that we looked at was the gifting of Lady Godiva's Manor at Newark to the monks at Stowe in 1055. This was during the reign of Edward the Confessor, who died childless in 1066. If there is one date that everyone seems to remember from history, it's the Battle of Hastings in the same year. So what was the effect of the Norman conquest on Newark, and how did it develop in the Middle Ages? The Norman conquest of England was the invasion and occupation of England by an army of Norman, Breton, Flemish and French soldiers led by the Duke of Normandy, William the Bastard, who became better known as William the Conqueror. When King Edward died at the beginning of 1066, the lack of a clear heir led to a disputed succession, in which several contenders laid claim to the throne. Edward's immediate successor was the Earl of Wessex, Harold Godwinson. Harold was immediately challenged by two powerful neighbouring rulers. Duke William claimed that he had been promised the throne by King Edward, and that Harold had sworn agreement to this. King Harold III of Norway, commonly known as Harold Hardrada, also contested the succession. His claim to the throne was based on an agreement between his predecessor, Magnus the Good, and Half Canute, previously King of England, whereby if either died without heir, the other would inherit both England and Norway. Both William and Harold set about assembling troops and ships to invade England. Harold was also allied with King Harold's brother, Tostig. Harold Hardrada invaded northern England in September 1066 and was victorious at the Battle of Fulford, but King Harold's army defeated and killed Hardrada and Tostig at the Battle of Stamford Bridge on the 25th of September. Within days, Williams landed in southern England. Harold turned around and marched south to oppose him. Harold's army confronted Williams' invaders on the 14th of October at the Battle of Hastings. Williams' forces defeated Harold, who was killed in the engagement. Although Williams' main rivals were gone, he still faced rebellions over the following years and was not secure on his throne until after 1072. The direct consequence of the invasion was the almost total elimination of the old English aristocracy and the loss of English control over the church. William dispossessed English landowners and confirmed their property on his followers. Some of the Saxon elite fled into exile. To control his new kingdom, William granted land to his followers, who built castles, commanding military strong points throughout the land. The Doomsday Book, a manuscript record of the Great Survey of much of England and parts of Wales, was completed by 1086. Other effects of the conquest included changes to the court and government, the introduction of Norman language as the language of the court, and changes in the competition of the upper classes. More gradual changes affected the agricultural classes and village life, with one of the main changes appearing to be the formal elimination of slavery. There was little alteration in the structure of government, as the new Norman administrators took over many of the forms of Anglo-Saxon government. England was divided into administrative units called shires. Shires were run by officials known as shire reeves, or sheriffs. The language of official documents changed from Old English to Latin. Forest laws were introduced, leading to the setting aside of large sections of England as royal forests such as Sherwood Forest. For most poorer people, there's not a great change, apart from new lords and the appearance of castles in the landscape, and where those lords could control their territory. The first Norman castle at Newark was probably a Mott and Bailey castle, with an earth mound known as a Mott, with a wooden tower or keep on top, with an outer enclosed area known as a Bailey, surrounded by a defensive ditch and a wooden wall, known as a palisade. A good example of a Mott can still be seen at Laxton, both of these castles were probably built following William's push into the north during the winter of 1068-9, to which became known as the Harrying of the North. Having built two castles at York, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle tells us he built castles at Nottingham and Lincoln and elsewhere in those parts. At this time, Newark was about the same size as Nottingham and sat strategically on the Fossway and probably at a ford over the River Trent. Part of the ramparts of this early castle were found during Newark Castle excavations in the 1990s. In the Doomsday Book of 1086, the manor of Newark was described as having around 4,560 acres of land under cultivation, with a population of around 90, 
including seven freed men, probably Danes. There were ten churches, eight priests, a mill and a fishery. The manor included Boulderton and Farndon, not just Newark. The number of churches may seem high, but they included those at Farndon, Boulderton, Winthorpe and Collington, and there appears to have been other chapels and a church on Northgate, as well as what became St Mary Magdalene. The lord of the manor at that time was Bishop Remedius, who in return for supporting William's conquest had been appointed Bishop of Dorchester on Thames. By 1075, he had moved his see from Dorchester to Lincoln, where he began work on the cathedral and took over the bishopric from the last Saxon bishop. It would appear that Godiva survived until shortly before Doomsday, and on her death, ownership of the manor was transferred to Remedius. From now until the Reformation, the manor of Newark would be owned by the bishops of Lincoln, apart from periods when it was taken into ownership by the king of the time. Bishop Remedius died in 1092, and was succeeded by Robert Bluey. When Bluey died suddenly in 1123, he was succeeded by Alexander, nephew of the Bishop of Salisbury. Alexander added to Lincoln Cathedral, founded four monasteries, and built castles at Banbury and Sleaford. He became known as Alexander the Magnificent. In 1135, King Henry I sealed a charter, giving Alexander permission to build a stone castle at Newark. Finding there wasn't enough room between the river and the Fossway to build a castle, Alexander appealed to the king for permission to divert the Fossway, which was granted. Shortly afterwards, he was also granted permission to build a bridge across the River Trent, thus creating a permanent route to the north, causing the Great North Road to be diverted via Newark so as to avoid a ferry crossing at the River Humber. The building of both the castle and the bridge would bring a strategic importance to Newark and would see it grow and thrive. Bishop Alexander developed the existing Norman castle as a bishop's palace, with two rectangular wards, a defendable stone inner court holding the main apartments, and an outer court housing ancillary buildings with earth and timber defences. Although the curtain walls were rebuilt in the 14th century, the gatehouse remains one of the finest 12th century gatehouses in the country. Originally there would have been a bridge from Beast Market Hill with a gate protecting it on this side of the river bridge. The niches to take the securing bar for the gate can still be seen in the gatehouse, as can the porter's lodge. It is hoped that if the project to put a roof on the gatehouse and a floor where the bishop's apartments were goes ahead, the entrance to the castle will once again be via a bridge from Beast Market Hill. During the Seven War, Civil War between 1135 and 53, between King Stephen and Empress Matilda, which became known as the Anarchy, Alexander was imprisoned and surrendered the castle to Stephen in 1139. Alexander died at Lincoln in 1148 and was succeeded by Robert de Chesney. The manor and castle were restored to the bishops of Lincoln. In 1205, King John visited Newark Castle for the first time. The following year, when the current bishop of Lincoln died, John took control of the castle, instructing it, entrusting it to William Welklin as part of his power struggle with the Pope. Although these struggles were resolved by 1213, John's troubles with his barons continued, resulting in Magna Carta in 1215, which he soon disregarded. Exasperated by his actions, barons offered the crown to Prince Louis, son of Philip of France. In August 1216, John ordered Newark Castle to be handed to one of his favourites, a mercenary named Robert de Gourhi. In September 1216, after relieving the siege of Lincoln by rebel barons, John travelled to Lynn, now King's Lynn. Leaving on the 11th of October, he went to Wisbeach, losing his baggage in the wash during the journey, and then on to Swineshead Abbey, where he was taken ill. He struggled on to the castle at Sleaford, where he was by now suffering with dysentery. He eventually arrived at Newark Castle on the 16th, and died on the night of the 18th, 19th of October, during a great storm. To give an example of how he was regarded, the chronicler Matthew Paris wrote that hell is a foul place made fouler by the presence of King John. His body was taken to Worcester, where he was interred in Worcester Cathedral. His nine-year-old son was crowned King Henry III at Gloucester Cathedral. Although the southwest tower of the castle was known as King John's Tower for many years, it is almost certain they would have used a bishop's private quarters, which were immediately above the gatehouse. By the following year, troops loyal to Prince Louis were still holding parts of the east of England. 
French troops led by the Count of Perche had taken the city of Lincoln, but Nicola de la Haye, the aged female Castellan, continued to hold Lincoln Castle for the king. William Marshall, the first Earl of Pembroke, known to some as the greatest knight, served as regent for Henry. Marshall called all nobles holding castles in England to a muster at Newark. Approximately 400 knights, 250 crossbowmen and a large auxiliary force of both mounted and foot soldiers were assembled. Marshall marched his forces to the city of Lincoln to break the siege. Having circled the city on the 20th of May and taken the north gate, Marshall's forces entered the castle and began firing the crossbows down into the enemy forces between the castle and cathedral at the top of Steep Hill, as shown by this illustration from Matthew Paris's Chronicle. Eventually, Marshall's forces charged the besieging forces, which collapsed into a rout. The city was pillaged by Marshall's army on the grounds it had been loyal to Louis, leading to the battle being called the Battle of Lincoln Fair. But a new young king, many of the barons turned away from Louis, and following a sea battle at Sandwich in August, Louis was forced to give up his claim to the throne the following month. Robert de Goy was ordered by Henry III to give up Newark Castle to its rightful owner, the Bishop of Lincoln. But despite several forceful reminders, de Goy refused, and in July 1218 the castle was besieged by a strong force led by William Marshall. With the king also in attendance. After a week, they had failed to take the castle, even though they used stone-throwing thro stone siege engines against the walls. Eventually, de Goy agreed to leave for £100 of silver to compensate for the provisions he would leave behind. During the Crusades, in 1119, the Knights Templars were formed to protect the Holy Sepulchre in Jeter Jerusalem and pilgrims travelling there. They went on to become a wealthy order with properties around Newark, in particular at Eagle and Temple Brewer. There's a record from 1185 of a hospital or almshouse at Newark, which may have been at the rear of the current NatWest Bank on Stonewood Street. Rumours about the Templars' secret initiation ceremony created distrust, and King Philip IV of France took advantage of this distrust to destroy them and erase his debt to them. In 1307, he had many of the Order's members in France arrested, tortured and given false confessions, and burned at the stake. Pope Clement V disbanded the order in 1312, under pressure from King Philip. In 1310, an order had been issued for the arrest and seizure of their properties in England, but Edward II and the English clergy were less keen to persecute them. However, following their dissolution, their properties were largely handed over to the Knights Hospitallers, or the Crown, and the leaders held by the Bishop of Lincoln in Newark Castle dungeons, although they were free to go by day and return at night. They left graffiti in the oubliettes in the northwest corner of the castle, with crosses carved into the niches in the walls. In the debtors' dungeon under the southwest tower, there is distinctive graffiti on a window sill. They prayed together in groups of seven and always in circles, as they believed that the power of the circle would amplify the prayer to God. The symbol for this is a circle split into seven segments. The other symbols are the Templar cross, the bird which is a phoenix rising from the ashes, and there's also something resembling a fossil, as you can see at the bottom. This is in fact a snake, coiled round itself, eating itself, and signifying rebirth. Towards the end of the 13th or early 14th century, the castle needed repairs. The whole of the riverfront was pulled down and rebuilt, with towers at the centre and northwest corner. Above the crypt, the great hall was rebuilt, with three large tracery windows looking out over the river. In 1322, when the rebellious barons were threatening Edward II, the castle was in the hands of Bishop Henry Burgish, Lord Treasurer and Lord Chancellor of England. Burgish supported the rebels' cause, so Edward took the castle from him and handled, handed it to Donald, Earl of Mar, nephew of Robert the Bruce. Edward himself came to Newark in 1323, and whilst at Newark, the Earl seems to have repaired the castle, as in 1325 there is a note that his rent to the Crown was cancelled. For this reason. In the same year, with the rebellion being over, the Earl handed the castle back to Edward, who returned it to Bishop Burgish. In the late 15th century, considerable alterations were made by Bishop Thomas Rotherham, who was the last cleric to leave his mark on the castle, the reverting to the crown at the Reformation. This included the beautiful Oriel window. 
It was also around 1135 that Henry I granted the Bishop of Lincoln permission to hold a fair on the feast day of St Mary Magdalene and the four days before. At this time, there were no shops as such, so apart from food, the only time when trade took place was at markets or fairs. It is believed that the first fairs took place at the castle. Markets and fairs normally took place on a Sunday and in churchyards, but in 1213 the people of Newark petitioned King John to change the market day to a Wednesday. This was granted, and it's the first time such a change was recorded in England. Wednesday continues to be one of the main market days today. Alexander also established St Leonard's Hospital outside Newark, in what is now Northgate Retail Park. This was not a hospital for medical care as we understand it today, but a place where hospitality in the, in the form of food and shelter could be obtained by travellers, or a place to support the old or sick. The hospital at Newark included a chapel and a lazar house for lepers, and was managed by a master who appointed a chaplain. The foundation deed specified how clothing and food for the poor persons was to be provided. Human remains, a chalice, and other artefacts were found when the road bridge over the railway was built in the 1960s. At that time, the bounds of Newark ended at what we know, now know as Bargate. Beyond this was a separate parish called Northgate, which extended to the Goat Bridge, now Water Lane. Beyond Northgate was Osmondthorpe, which is where the hospital was built. St Leonard's Trust still exists today, and has almshouses on Sherwood Avenue, the Mount and St Leonard's Court. Although we can't be sure, it's likely that the Church of St Mary Magdalene is built on the site of the previous Anglo-Saxon church. Work began on the current church in the 12th century, and the central piers and crypts survive from the original church. The upper parts of the tower and spire were completed about 1350. The nave dates from around 1384 and 1393, and the chapel from chancel from 1489. The church spire has been a landmark for centuries with a tower and octagonal spire 236 feet high or 72 metres. This is the highest in Nottinghamshire and reputed to be the fifth tallest in the UK. Another religious house in Newark was the Friary. The Austin Friars or Hermits of St Augustine were the first order to settle in Newark. They'd first arrived in England in 1252. Although the exact date for the settlement in Appleton Gate is unknown, there is a deed of 1334 that refers to Freer Lane, which may be Friars Lane, although the location is not identified. What is more certain is that by 1499, the observant Franciscans or Grey Friars had settled on Appleton Gate on the present day site of the Friary. They may have been established here by Henry VII, who left money to them in his will. These friars have been described as the Salvation Army of the day. The friar would have had a guest house, a library, a chapel and burial ground, and some of the excavated human remains are housed at the resource centre. The friar would continue to be used by the Grey Friars until 1534, when they were driven from it by Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries. The other religious house on Appleton Gate was a Chantry house, which had been established by Dame Alice Fleming, widow of Alan Fleming in the in the 14th century. This provided accommodation for the chantry priests who prayed for the souls of those who could afford to build a chantry chapel in the church. Through these acts your soul might spend less time in purgatory before the day of judgment. 14 chantry chapels were founded at Newark and by 1534 there were 15 chantry priests. Many of these chapels in churches were destroyed after the Reformation but in Newark the Markham and mirroring chapels, shown here, survive. On the outer wall of the Markham Chantry, two panels are painted with the Dance of Death. On the left, the dancing skeleton flourishes a carnation, a symbol of mortality, and points to the grave, whilst on the right, a well-dressed young merchant has his hand on his purse. The message is, as I am today, so you will be tomorrow a warning that death awaits even the most well-to-do, and wealth cannot buy death off, a popular theme in the Middle Ages. Another religious feature were weighed side crosses, and the best surviving example is Bowman Cross. Bowman Cross is not an Eleanor Cross, as some have claimed. King Edward I's wife Eleanor died at Harby near Lincoln in September 1290, and the body was taken in stages to London. 
Crosses were erected at the places where the body rested overnight, the last being at Charing Cross. She did not rest in Newark, though, so Bowman Cross cannot be associated with her. It would appear that Bowman was a suburb of Newark, first recorded in 1310, outside the town walls, and named after a member of the Bowman family. It was one of three crosses in and around Newark, with one near the Friary and the Market Cross. The first documentary evidence of the cross is from 1367. From its style and decoration, it is late 13th, early 14th century in date, although there is some debate. It may have served as a, served as a place for devotion at a crossroads, and it once stood at the junction of five roads before it was moved. It was restored in 1778 and 1801, and moved to its present site on London Road in 1965. The cross consists of an octagonal plinth with a shaft 13 feet high, delicately tapering towards the top. <coughs> a canopied niche at the base shelters a saintly figure, now unrecognisable. While the top is surmounted by an ornamental octagon octagonal capital, having on each side a niche containing a small seated figure, again unrecognisable. The church would have been just in inside the town walls, which extended from one of three gates on Bargate, along the line of Slaughterhouse Lane and the Mount, to the town ditch running along Appleton Gate and Carter Gate. There was another town gate on what is now Bridge Street. On the south side, the walls ran along a Potter Dyke, now Lombard Street, and part of the wall can be, set, be seen set into the bowling alley wall on Lombard Street. The southern gate would have been on Millgate. Excavations on Slaughterhouse Lane in advance of building Morrison's found evidence of the wall on this side. Bargate was not taken down until 1762. It was from here that we think the stone corbel in the shape of a head may have come. The east gate on Bridge Street was taken down in 1784. The basic form of the town centre as we know it today, with its marketplace and streets leading off it, took shape during this period. The church was built on the wealth of the town as it developed its trades. In the beginning of the pe period, these would have been based on agriculture, but wool and cloth would increase in importance. It appears that the people of Newark were dyeing and selling cloth during the reign of Henry II, but in 1332, Edward III, in an attempt to improve the wool trade on which the prosperity of the kingdom depended, invited Flemish weavers to settle in England to teach the locals how to manufacture fine cloth. Newark, already the centre of a wool-producing area and engaged in the cloth trade, naturally attracted them, and the Fleming family became inhabitants in Edward's reign. Alan Fleming's name is first recorded in August 1339, and he went on to become a prominent citizen. He died in 1361 and is commemorated by the Fleming Brass in the North Choir Isle of the Church, which dates from 1363 and is one of the largest brasses in England, measuring 2.8 metres by 1.7 metres. He was one of a number of Flemish merchants that settled in Newark and exported wool to Bruges and Ghent, where it was turned into cloth that was then exported throughout Europe from France to Russia. The Nottingham monasteries at Rufford, Welbeck, Worksop, Shelford and Newstead were also selling their wool to foreign merchants. All Newark wool was exported from either Boston or Hull and would have been carefully weighed and sealed. When it arrived at its destination, Newark merchants, such as James Kaiser at Bruges, might have dealt with the wool. As well as Flanders, wool was exported to Calais. The wool trade remained important throughout the Middle Ages, but declined towards the end, as it was replaced by the cloth trade. There are references to fullers and fulling mills from the 13th century, so the making of cloth was an important industry throughout the period, until the 16th century. Drapers and mercers dealt in cloth, and the first recorded in the 14th century. After woolen cloth, hides and leather working were the next most important trades. Later in the period, there are five tanners, six shoemakers, one saddler, and two glovers recorded as members of the Trinity Guild. Tanning was a dirty and smelly business, so it would have been established on the outskirts of the town, along with the mills on Millgate. Other trades would have catered for the travellers on the Great North Road and Foss Way. Inns and taverns were established to house the travellers, and one of the earliest is the Old White Hart, which dates to the 14th century. Dendrochronologies dated the earliest timbers to 1315. 
the current building was restored in 1979 to 80 and repainted as it might have looked at the time. The painted plaster figures represent St Michael, St Anthony and St Barbara. And this is one of the original figures. The building consists of three parts. The late 15th century four bay three storey front range facing onto the marketplace with its decorated elevation. The 14th century wing next to the front range and a 14th century hall to the rear. It may have originally been built as a merchant or wealthy craftsman's house and was then converted into an inn during the last decade of the 14th century. It was one of a number of inns that would surround the marketplace, including the Saracen's Head and the Cardinal's Hat or Talbot, later the Clinton Arms. A maltster was first recorded in 1276 and most of the inns would have had their own breweries to slake the thirst of the travellers. In addition to these trades, there would have been builders, masons, blacksmiths, and all of the trades needed within the town of Newark's size and importance. Closely associated with the church and with trades were the guilds. The religious guilds founded in Newark in the 13th and 14th century provided charity to their members, as well as a feeling of fraternity and goodwill amongst the members, enhanced by the annual feasts, which were keenly anticipated events in the life of the town. They had the power to purchase land, build chapels, erect altars, maintain chaplains and priests, to hold meetings and make an annual procession through the town. The charitable aims would be to provide a funeral or support to members and their families who were sick or had fallen on, on hard times. The wealthiest and most influential guild in Newark was that of the Holy Trinity, which had its chapel in the south transept of St Mary Magdalene. The Trinity stone, which was risen in this chapel, is today set into the wall at the west end of the North Isle. The design is made with three faces run together, representing the Holy Trinity of one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Other religious guilds were those of Corpus Christi and St Mary. The Trinity Guild became a powerful corporation, which was strong enough to control the affairs of the town until it was incorporated as a borough in 1549. The guilds had their own hall or meeting place known as the Guild Hall. This was originally in what is now Guild Hall Street, off Boulderton Gate. This was separate from the Moot Hall, later the King's Hall, and now Starbucks. The Moot Hall was where the bylaws and governances of a town would be decided before the building of the Town Hall. Artifacts in the collection include domestic items such as this jug from Barnby, and another jug dating to around 1400 from Claypole. Objects of religious devotion include this Pilgrim's Badge, showing St George and the Dragon from Edwin Stone, Churches used acoustic jars to improve the sound of worship, and this is one of two acoustic jars from Upton Church. Personal items include this annular brooch from Shelton, a silver gilt medieval cross-shaped pendant dating from the 13th or 14th century, a silver gilt crowned heart finger ring consisting of a crowned heart and a four-lobed clover dated to between 1400 and 1550, a silver fide or friendship ring dating from the late 15th or early 16th century in the form of two clasp hands. And finally, this gold 13th century finger ring with a blue stone setting, possibly a sapphire, from Cullum Hills. The gold ring was partly paid for by the Friends group, to whom we are very grateful. The final object is this touchstone for tets, testing precious metals and its leather, leather sheath. The sheath is a beautiful piece of decorated leatherwork of the 15th century, which has a Flemish inscription, Love God Van Al, meaning love God more than all. The black stone is a slate or lidite, which is for assaying gold or silver. There's a finely grained surface on which soft metals leave a visible trace. The metal to be assayed is rubbed on the touchstone next to a sample of a metal of known purity. Because different alloys of gold have different colours, the unknown sample can be compared to samples of known purity. The trace will react in different ways to specific concentrations of nitric acid, thereby identifying the quality of the gold. As 24 karat gold is not affected, but 14 karat gold will show chemical activity. Assaying today is done in London or Birmingham, but in the Middle Ages, assayers travelled the country. The inscription on the leather may indicate the Flemish connection in Newark. The Middle Ages ended at 1485, when Richard III was defeated at the Battle of Bosworth by Henry Tudor, who became Henry VII. The beginning of the Tudor period was a period of unease for the new dynasty, and there would be several challenges to Henry's crown. 
One of those would culminate in a battle fought a few miles from Newark. Next time, we'll look at this battle and the Tudor and early Stuart period leading up to the Civil War.